This is the Roller Coaster Podcast, and I'm your host, Lucy Q. Life is a wild ride. It has twists and turns. It's scary, exciting, and downright fun. So throw your head back, arms in the air, and come along with me for the ride. Life is like a roller coaster, baby. Okay, before we get started, check out NectarGrowth.com, N-E-C-T-U-R-E-G-R-O-W-T-H.com. It's free to join, but not for long. Nectar is an extension of the roller coaster. It's where you can start your own journey of self-exploration and growth. In Nectar, you'll find different topics of interest, daily blogs, affirmations, journal prompts, and you can connect with some of the fantastic coaches that have been on the roller coaster. Soon, we'll be adding videos, meditations, live discussions, and events. Our signature course is a journey of self-improvement, and it's valued at $397. But once you join, it's available to you at no cost. So if you're feeling stuck, if you feel like you need to change and not sure where to start, start with Nectar Growth Network. Come join us. You know you're worth it. Now, let's get on with today's show. I've been sharing my journey of self-improvement over the past few weeks. And sharing these personal stories of transformation hasn't always been easy. Because what I'm sharing, well, it's personal. It's part of me. And being vulnerable isn't easy. But it is critical for growth. Joining me today is Deborah Lynn, who has embodied her journey in her new book, Divine Mirror, a painting's hidden gift of conscious healing, where she shares her story of finding her voice, unconditional love, and the journey home to self. Hi, Deborah. Hi, Lucy. How are you today? I'm fantastic. How are you? I am fantastic, too. I'm so happy to be with you. Thank you. What led you to write this book? Because I've been on the journey myself and, you know, every time, you know, you've been through hell, you, you want to share your learnings with other people because I mean, ultimately we want to, we want to prevent somebody else from going through what we just went through, but you know, what led you to write the book and, you know, what was your story behind it? Well, I think that the impetus for writing the book was actually research that I was doing on this very mysterious little painting. But what the catalyst was to the research, to the painting, was a profound moment of healing with my, uh, my father, who's now passed, now he passed a year ago, uh, who was a serious alcoholic and that I had grown up in an enormous amount of emotional trauma. It, I was the sea. I was, this was only say 10 years ago. So I was in my early fifties when this moment of healing happened. So I'd had a whole lifetime of trauma up to this sort of doorway. And uh, he had, it was one of these moments where I found myself by myself with my father and feeling terrified. And I looked up, I'd been through three marriages, three divorces. My life was just topsy-turvy, upside down, had no real sense of self in terms of feeling really good about myself other than my work. And I, I looked up and went, the key lies with your father. And I woke up one day after I discovered that I was going to have to live with him literally for a week by myself while my mother was in the hospital. And made the decision that instead of running, which was my pattern, and ignoring, trying to avoid um, going and distracting myself with, you know, shopping or other activities, I literally said, no, you're going to sit right here. And you're going to face this and face him. And it doesn't matter what he does, you're going to sit and face into this energy. And I spent that that week literally allowing whatever happened to happen. And he would do his pattern of getting drunk towards the end of the the day. 
and all of a sudden everything would go to hell. It, it literally just our, our relationship, the trauma, the aggressiveness, all the 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 feelings of um, emotional abuse, for lack of a better word. I was I felt like I was always being attacked by him. And I just allowed it to happen. I sat and observed it and I watched and I didn't judge and I didn't run away and I let myself be uncomfortable. And after those few days of walking that journey with him, my mother came home from the hospital and in their preparation to leave for a trip together to go to Maryland, it was literally a weird kind of thing where they had to get up there. I, um, suddenly was confronted with a crash in the front hallway. Okay, so my parents are packing like this and I hear this crash in the front hallway and I go out to check it out and it's my father who of course is intoxicated, has fallen, hit, hit, hit a large vase, broken the vase, he's on the floor, slumped up against the wall and I, I, I can't tell whether he's hurt or anything at this point and I, basically sit there with him and I hear my mother coming from the other room ready to rage on with him and I stopped my mother told her I would take care of my father go pack get out of this energy and I sat with my dad and had the most profound moment of healing compassion I stopped my judgment I stopped my anger I looked at a man who in that moment was literally a puddle on the floor crying because he had broken the space and tried to comfort him, check to see if he was okay. And he started murmuring the words that he would always murmur in at the height of his intoxication, which was, you'll never understand, you'll never understand, you'll never understand. And I finally just said to him, you're right. I will never understand. I will never understand what has happened to you. I will never understand what you've gone through. I never will understand. And he paused and I paused. And then I just basically looked at him and said, well, let me guess, let me guess what's happened to you. And I started on a checklist of, we had lots of suspicions of his service to this country that yeah. might have caught, you know, like military coming yeah. back. Um, it was PTSD. PTSD, yeah. It was PTSD, and I knew I was facing PTSD. Um, but I made a checklist, and I listed every horrible thing I could think of that a human being could do, that they would feel so much remorse for, that they would intoxicate them to, to this, themselves to the point of blackout on a regular basis. And he, he was suddenly dead sober looking at me and tears running down his face. Um, he couldn't say anything because he had sworn himself to silence about this. Whatever it was, he was gonna take it to his grave. And I, I told him that if he needed my forgiveness, he had it. Asked him if he had made his peace with God. He said he had. And then I said, well, you need to let it go. And the next day, after this moment of sort of profound, what I would call profound healing, because I never thought in my lifetime I would ever be in that space. He and I were standing looking out at the garage, which was a disaster that I was going to be looking at and weeding through while they were gone. And I saw this small wooden object. And he looked at me and said, do you like it? And then I said, yes, before I even knew what it was. Because <laughs> he never asked me if I liked anything. And turns out it was a small painting. He gave me the painting. I took it into my room and put it under the light and suddenly realized I was looking at one of the most profound spiritual paintings that I had ever seen. And I knew what it was somehow. And I knew what I was looking at and I saw sacred geometry. And it happened because of that forgiveness exercise. I'm quite certain that the painting would not have come into my life had we not had that moment. Did he tell you where he got it from? Not initially. I just took it back and looked at it. I, I saw this stuff and I, I came out of the bedroom and I said, dad, where did it come from? And then I asked him. And then he told me that my Nana, my grandmother, his mother had purchased it at a Palm Beach auction of the estate of a man named Joseph Early Widener, 
Widener Museum at Harvard Museum, Widener Library, Widener, who was the one of the primary benefactors of the National Gallery of Art Widener. Uh, suddenly I'm holding something tiny, very small, that was evidently in Joseph Widener's personal study his whole life. It didn't go to the museum with $20 million that he he donated and bequeathed to the National Gallery when before he died in 1943 or 1942, it went to the National Gallery. $20 million worth of art. And here I'm sitting at looking at this little painting and I'm like, okay, this is something. This isn't nothing, this is something. And that little painting took, has taken me on a 10, -year -old, a 10 year journey, which has continued to this day. We are at a new moment with it as of today. Oh, what's, it, what's the new moment with it then? It's in Australia right now. Oh. Uh, it's been in Australia now for about a week. And it has just, as of yesterday, gone through scanning in a particle beam, beam line accelerator in Australia with an artist, uh, an art scientist uh, researcher that is basically trying to determine a whole lot of stuff about this very mysterious little painting. Wow. Yeah. So, do you do you have a? Is it been given a value? Nope, can't value it. So it's it's one of these things where okay, I I I actually have inherited a hidden painting under a painting. I was worried. Not, I was painting, worried. not it's not like painted over. Yeah, it's like someone went to an enormous amount of trouble to glue an engraving, a paper engraving over a separate painting and then painted over it. So it's literally two separate oil paintings. That's incredible. And the only incredible. way I discovered that is, well, I got, I've been researching it now since my dad gave it to me. So the very first Williamstown conservators in Massachusetts did the first research on this uh, about eight years ago. And they did an x-ray and it showed a hidden figure under the x-ray. So we knew something was going on. And then I could see clues in the top level, like somebody took this rather famous version of a painting, meaning this is a famous painting. And this particular version doesn't exist anywhere in the world. You, you, you won't see it. I, if you, if you get the book, then you get to see it because I've taken pictures. I made that's why I did it. Cause I wanted people to see this thing. Um, there are co other color versions of this original paint, meaning the original grisaille is all in grays and it's at the Courtauld Museum in London. It's called Christ and the woman taken in adultery. So now we're in Da Vinci code land. So we have Mary Magdalene, Jesus, a man who turns out to be the profile of Pope Gregory the Great, who was the one that denigrated Mary Magdalene in 532 AD or something like that in one sermon that turned her into a whore. So we've got him on the front of this painting. We've got Caiaphas, the man that imprisoned Jesus. He's on the, right? There's all these characters that I've been able to figure out and research through my research. And then I've been researching this, uh, the original artist, but we really don't know who did this. There, it's not a signed painting. At least it's not signed on the top. It is signed on the bottom. On the bottom so, layer? On the bottom. The bottom painting has a signature and a date. So the fingers crossed moment for me this week is that this brilliant young art research scientist in Australia that works with this particle beam technology is going to be able to get to the bottom of the mystery. Are there any speculations on what it is, who painted it, anything like that? Well, I have my own theories and so far I've been right, which is interesting because some of it is research and some of it is, is uh, intuition. I was gonna say, and that's the sort of, that's the part that I'm getting at is, you know, everything that you went through, your journey to get this painting, it just seems like there's something else involved even going back to, you know, your father had it for how long? Uh, well, my grandmother died in like 1982. So it had been in the garage since 1982. And he gave it to me in 2010. And that's it, is that he, 
he knew something about it or in some way had a connection to it. And that's why he held on to it. Be because what's interesting is my mom and dad took it somewhere and had it looked at and they told him it was worthless. <laughs> <laughs> So I was, you know, the, and for me, you know, that's the challenge with it. We, we haven't been able to attribute it. And because that, that it puts it in this really interesting nebula zone right now, it looks like a really fancy 400 year old paint by numbers. <laughs> but the reality is that what's underneath it um, is uh, something quite different. So, so the journey took me um, and I, I talk about, you know, my spiritual healing through this painting because in order for me to research this, I had to get out of my comfort zone and actually trust the instincts I was having as people were, were basically closing doors, not willing to talk to me. I reached out to university professors. I reached out to uh, specialists in this particular uh, genre of art. I reached out to museums. I, re I reached out to everybody and no one wanted to have a conversation with me. And finally, I watched a little documentary called Finding the Lost Da Vinci. There was a man named Dr. Maurizio Saracini, who was, was the research scientist in Florence, Italy, who believed that underneath these huge Vasari murals in the Hall of 500, which is the big hall that is um, sort of um, used as the backdrop for in the Inferno, Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, when the, they fall through the ceiling of that museum, they're falling through the Hall of 500 in that scene. Okay, so the Hall of Five, these huge, huge murals. He believed that there was a hidden, lost Da Vinci mural under one of these Vasaris. And so this, mo this documentary was about him getting permission to drill through the Vasari to find the Da Vinci, if he could do it. And it's very interesting because it's, a, it's again, heart-wrenching to watch this, this art research, which is literally like, oh my God, slow and oh my God, tedious. And, you know, it's, it, it, yeah, it's very challenging to try to do this sort of backwards research of something, right? So I decided to reach out to Dr. Maurizio Saracini. Didn't, did not know him, had no connection. I, I got on LinkedIn and noticed that if I clicked LinkedIn plus or premium, that I could suddenly email someone for 30 days. And I clicked on it as a trial because I couldn't afford it at the time and wrote a letter to this research scientist in, in Italy and said, this is, I'm this person and I have this painting and I have no idea what to do and I'm trying to figure it out. And he wrote me back. And from that moment, everything started moving forward. So he spent three days with this painting, um, uh, let's see, about three years ago. And then everything stopped in its tracks again. But he was able to, to literally drill down into the painting, take a core sample, and he's the one that discovered that under this engraving, under this oil painting on top was a separate oil painting in its entirety glued underneath that's incredible have you you know before your father passed away did you talk any more about the painting he yes we talked about it periodically about sort of this research i was doing and you know trying to see if i could find out what this thing was um by the time we got to the dr saracini uh research his faculties were pretty far gone um, he and my mom had been in a lot of trauma at that point. They were now just going into assisted living. The, the signs of dementia were there. You know, I was still living through the trauma of the relationships, meaning the, the, the dynamics didn't actually change. I changed. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. It's going back to that day that your, your father was on the floor with the pieces of the broken vase all around him, you know, you you changed in that moment but did he change at all no no not no but because i changed our relationship changed so because i dropped the anger because i stopped being resistant to him as a human being um because i basically i opened my heart and i was i was in acknowledgement of the fact that 
he was my father and that he had given me tremendous gifts across my lifetime that previously I hadn't been willing to look at or acknowledge, that, that shift of consciousness in me shifted how everything looked. It didn't specifically shift either my parents. What did you say to yourself in that moment, though, that made you look at things differently and that created the subsequent mind shift? You know, I think that because I was trying to get to the core, you know, like look back to these divorces, these marriages and these divorces, and I married men who brought different elements of control and um, dysfunction into my life. All right, each of them brought a new piece of the puzzle, if you will. And if I look back, all of them were wonderful men, but they all, they all did this and I ended up in this state of divorce. And I realized that if I was actually going to have a functional relationship in this lifetime, one where I felt loved and that I, I was loving, that I could actually have this new paradigm, if you will, of love in my life, that I was going to have to shift my perspective on myself and forgive self in regards to the people in my life. That, it, that I, I think that the big shift was that I suddenly went, especially, you know, with the name of my book, Divine Mirror, I looked and I saw that my mirror was shattered, that I was shattered inside, that there was distorted beliefs and distorted thinking within my own mindset that was now playing out in front of me in a myriad of ways. It was no longer about anyone outside of myself. I think that that fundamental awareness and then the subsequent, okay, given that's true, you're gonna have to forgive self and take a deep breath and say, it's okay that you have to essentially start over reframe it all. What were you forgiving yourself for? Probably mostly holding on to the um, resentment, judgment, um, feelings of, of self-loathing that were now mine, that I was, that I had, because I'm, I'm really empathic. And so as an empath, I feel everything that everybody feels within a, I don't know, mile radius is how it feels sometimes. Like I can feel it, I walk into a room and I feel everybody's emotional bodies. I had to sort of pseudo disconnect a little bit from that empathic piece of me and go within and reparent, if you will, myself. So it was a little bit of that kind of a process of going in and to my inner child and all the children within me and all my teenagers and all, all the pieces of me. Someone once said, you know, we've got our two, four, six, eight, 22, 40 year old inside us to this day. And they all wanted to tell me about it. And so I had to, I just had to stop and take time with self for a while and stop my codependent nature of wanting to take care of the world. Fix everything. Fix everything around me. I stopped fixing and I started, I didn't, I didn't even really go to fixing myself. I went to a place of accepting, acceptance, allowing. Was it just in an inner journey as in, you know, processing your thoughts or did you have any external tools and practices that you use that helped facilitate the change? Well, I would say I had external tools and practices, and then there were some, occasionally some key people along my path that I actually connected with. But I think because of my trust issues in the world, I, I dealt with most of it internally. Um, but the practices, I, I read a lot. I read a lot of books. 
um, I started to attempt to meditate, even though it was very difficult for me to slow my mind down. I started to understand that I didn't really have to. I could just sort of breathe. And I had, fortunately, I had a person come into my life who was really good at meditation. And by observing what he did, I was able to sort of start the process of that very slowly. I could sometimes only do it for a minute, but you know, now I can actually calm myself in the morning and stay still for an hour. And I'm not in, I'm not in any kind of conscious thought state. So over this period, I've been able to learn and practice that, but it's taken me, oh, at least 10 years, at least eight, eight to 10 years. You've piqued my curiosity there. What was he doing differently in meditation that you learned that first enabled all, you to meditate for that like for up to an hour? First of all, he didn't have rules. <laughs> you know, like okay, you yeah. do it this way, right? It wasn't like okay, all right, you're gonna you know ohm and you got to go to a you know go to a cloud place or like that. You know, um, he literally would just wake up and sit in a chair, and. And then he would wake up and sit in a chair. And if he woke up and sat in the chair and he got distracted, he would allow himself to be distracted. He didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't make rules and he didn't make himself wrong if he couldn't hold state. He called it holding state. And uh, his teacher who I actually met in a training once was Joey Klein, who has a wonderful consciousness training program out in Colorado. And um, Joey was his master teacher. And so I, I was actually sort of getting some of that mastery training skill level from, from him as he, he sort of passed him along. He, we, and we were connected for three years and I kind of see him as the healing relationship of my life because he brought me so many spiritual components to what would help make this easier, if that makes sense. Um, but meditation was one piece of my puddle, puzzle. Um, I had a friend that was a psychologist and she did something called play therapy. So because I really wasn't into, I'm going to go talk to you about all these issues. I just, I just couldn't do it because for me, it evoked more of it. I couldn't seem to, I just kept spinning the wheels. I didn't actually move into another paradigm of consciousness, which is what my objective was. And I had had enough consciousness training early on in life to know that it was possible to shift paradigms, but in order to get there, you can't go there from the way you're thinking now. You have to transcend it somehow. And so Nikki did play therapy with me and my, my, um, my inner sumo, you know, when I got angry, she'd make me go to a sumo position, hold the position. And like I was moving through molasses or mud, she'd make me move the energy. And I I'd start laughing. So it was like, I needed those kinds of methodologies that weren't so conventional, maybe. That makes they sense. That, so I could play and I didn't get too serious about anything, <laughs> which I can do. Wow. That's really, the, the book is, is really intriguing and I can't wait to find out about what goes on with the painting and, and what they discover. It, it's got a, it's certainly got um, that uh, Inferno. What was his other one? The first one? Yeah, um, he did, did um, well, Da Vinci Code. He did Angels and Demons, which was yeah. really intense. Okay, well, and so let me just, let me just go back to the painting here for a second. So what's interesting about the painting and why it's so profound to me that it's come to me, that I, first of all, I have an interest in the history. I have an interest, I've had an interest in European history. I've had an interest in the history of the church. Um, I've read a lot about the Knights Templar, about uh, Arthurian legendary, Jesus and Mary Magdalene, um, the Cathars. I had done 35 years of reading about this particular subject matter. And here I am with a little painting in my hands of Christ and the woman taken in adultery. Okay. But the hot, the hot scene. Yeah. And that's, that's, what's really curious about the situation. I agree. I agree. And that's what happened for me. I was like, you know, there, there, there is the belief sometimes that things will come to us that are, that belong with us, that we are meant to, right. That we're oh, magnetizing, sure. right. So I clearly, I magnetize this thing. Well, what I, what I figured out in within a fairly short period of time is that this was a, a colored version of 
Peter Bruegel, the elders, Christ and the woman take an adultery. So Peter Bruegel painted the original Grisaille, which is at the Courtauld, in 1565. This painting, we of course, we don't know, but when I took it to one person, they said it looked like a Rembrandt and that's what it, it does. It looks like a Rembrandt. It's really dark. It's really, it's sort of austere and very, very simplistic in its color and its color palette. If you look up Joseph, uh, uh, Peter Bruegel, the elder and Christ and the woman taken adultery, you'll see other paintings show up that are current copies, color copies, as well as engravings of this work. And the two color copies that exist or the color versions are very, very colorful and bright, which give you this sort of sense of a circus. It's, you know, the woman taken in adultery looks like she's surrounded at, you know, Barnum and Bailey. That's how it feels. And it doesn't feel serious at all. And you look at mine and you're like, holy cow, something's going on here. And anyone that's been in the presence of this painting in close proximity is like, they want to move away from it. Well, you mentioned that you saw hints of ancient geometry in it. There, yeah, sacred geometry. Sacred geometry. I actually could see that the structure of the work was formed around a six-pointed star. And I'd been looking at paintings trying to find sacred geometry for years and couldn't see anything, anything. It never made any sense to me until I looked at this painting and then I went, oh, there's a six-pointed star. So on the cover of my book, I've drawn the six-pointed star for people. So you can go, that's what sacred geometry is. It's like, it's lines that go between characters and things that suddenly appear. And there's a message, right? But those weren't the pieces that made me dig deeper. I saw on the prayer shawl of this head priest, about an inch and a half of red on the, on the very tip of it, like the prayer shawl had been dipped in blood. Not on any other version. Is there any indication of any foul play? Okay, the, the prayer shawls are all white. Okay, so mine's got blood on the tip of it. So I look a little closer. Now I look and I see a face of a demon. It took me two years to see this. I see a face of a demon behind Mary Magdalene and I'm like, okay, all right, now somebody has purposely put these little tiny things in here that are not on any of the other versions and not on any of the, the, um, the color versions that we know of. Um, and I, that's when the x-ray was done. And I, I, in the x-ray, and I do include a, a picture of the x-ray in the book as well. In the x-ray, behind the little face of the demon is a demon in the x-ray. The, the, the priest left hand in the x-ray looks like it becomes the head of a demon. And, and that's then a bit creepy. <laughs> it's incredibly creepy. Now what's really <laughs> interesting. Okay. It's creepy. It's already creepy. Um, but if you consider the time frame when it was painted, that was an incredibly creepy time where at the time it was the 30 year war, the Catholic church was rounding people up and killing them en masse if they did not reform. And Peter Bruegel was painting in, in drawing etchings of literally body parts. You, there's a whole book where 20 of his plates are all torn up people and horrible little scenes. That's because th that was going on around them. It was a war zone, it was a war zone. Right. So, but I guess the, the interesting thing is, so I've just seen very initial scans that have come out of Australia and the, just like when I got the um, research from the Williamstown eight years ago and they said, oh, look, there's something hidden underneath the painting. He, uh, this the scientist uh, reached out to me and said, I can see a body in front of the image. And I looked on it and now, and so I'm like, the, the I have a feeling it's creepier than I than even I thought. Yikes. Yeah. So so we will find out. <laughs> to be continued for to sure. Be continued how creepy this is. <laughs> <laughs> Deborah, what's the best way for people to connect with you and get your book and learn more about your little painting? Yeah, yes. Go to my very light and love website. <laughs> it doesn't look <laughs> creepy at all. No, it doesn't. Um, <laughs> no, it's you know, um, it's very pink. Um, Deborah Lynn, so my name.org will take someone to my website and then through there they'll find things for their voice and the singing that they may be interested in and then the divine mirror and the book, um, you can kind of 
kind of weave your way through the website. That's probably the best way. And then there's a way to contact me via email through the site. Perfect. Well, if you're looking at connecting with Deborah, make sure you check out the show notes. I'm going to have all of her links in there. And Deborah, thank you so much for joining me and sharing your rather curious story of your little painting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. Want to chat or share your ideas about today's show? Pop me an email at hello at the rollercoasterpodcast.com. Don't forget to connect with me on Facebook and Instagram at the Roller Coaster Podcast. Our theme song, Roller Coaster, was performed by the Lucky Setback. Audio editing by the one and only Jeff Quigley of Quigley Creative. Life is like a roller coaster, baby. Yeah.